Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Andy Walton. I'm the VP of Technical Sales, and we're very pleased to uh, bring to you uh, deconstructing Amazon EC2 instance types and capabilities via analytics. Uh, today, I'm joined by one of our senior cloud advisors, Faisal Mohammed. Uh, Faisal is going to take you through some of the, the deep details of uh, some of the interesting things that uh, AWS has uh, introduced to the marketplace in the last number of months. And then we're going to go through uh, just a short presentation of just a couple of the capabilities of those, uh, of those new services, some of the capabilities and how Densify helps in optimizing those new services. And we'll uh, conclude with a brief demonstration. And so uh, let's go to the next slide, Faisal. Just before we get started, I uh, wanted to let everyone know that you can post your questions into the GoToWebinar questions window. Uh, we will save time at the end to address them. And if I notice them during the presentation uh, and they're salient to the topic, I will, uh, I will answer them uh, right away. But we will certainly address them by the end of the session as well for the folks that are already asking. We will uh, be providing a recording of this presentation uh, early next week uh, to all participants who registered. So at this stage, let's turn it over to Faisal, and he's going to go through the details here. And uh, I should also point out the fact that uh, Faisal has recently written a number of blog entries on our website, including uh, um, a specific blog on this particular topic. So take it away, Faisal. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure today to talk about this topic. This is one of my uh, personal uh, favorites to talk about EC2 instance types. Uh, when I deal with customers, I realize there's a lot of complexity in figuring out you know, how to decide what's the right type of compute for your workload. And, and that comes down to a lot of different factors. Like what, what happens overall, when you look at AWS EC2, there's over 275 different EC2 instance types alone. So when developers or app owners or system admins are trying to decide what kind of instance type to select, there's a plethora, plethora of selections that they need to make. So not only the instance types, but they also have to start considering what kind of chipset should I be using? Should I go with the Intel? Should I go with the AMD Epic chipsets? Or most recently, AWS announced the Graviton chipsets. So AWS is manufacturing these alongside with the Annapurna Labs. Uh, so whether you want to go with those ARM processors, x86 versus ARM processors. Uh, other things that developers and app owners or even system owners consider are the actual instance families. Now, AWS has about nine different instance families. I've just listed the five most common ones that we come across. So whether you're using compute intensive instance families or memory intensive applications? Should you use storage optimized? Uh, should you go with something like a burstable performance? Or are, is your workload more geared towards a general purpose workload? Uh, there's so many different selections. Other things that developers have to also consider, what are my application specific requirements? Okay, I'm running an Nginx web server. Okay, what exactly are the minimum requirements for the baseline performance? Uh, are there any particular requirements for me to deliver this application? So perhaps there's an uptime requirement. I need to scale for a minimum of three instances. Other things I need to consider are my pricing considerations. How should I go about buying them? Should I go fully on demand because I don't know what my demand patterns are? Or if I know I have a steady state workload, maybe I should go with something like reserved instances or savings plan. Um, alternatively, if I have multiple development environments, such as it's a dev, a sandbox, and a production, well, you know, how hot or how cold or how aggressively do I want to run them? For example, if it's a production environment, then I may want to size it a little bit bigger than normal, just in case, you know, if there are any kind of service SLAs I need to meet. Whereas it's, if it's a dev environment, then I can downsize it more aggressively because there's, there's no harm done if the environment goes down. Uh, Lastly, the other things I would consider, for example, software should I be using? Am I going to use a custom AMI or am I going to use a pre-baked AMI? Because as you know, not every single AMI is available for every single instance type. Uh, what's the effort required in setting these AMIs up? Are there some customizations required? Uh, as you know, you never always set, only set up an EC2 instance. The EC2 instance is part of an ecosystem. It needs to talk to either a storage like an S3, or a database, or it could be a fleet of web servers that needs to communicate with each other. So you have to figure out all these security settings and who's gonna access what and what region to deploy. And so there's a lot of things to consider when you're setting up an EC2 instance. And that's where the complexity comes in overall. Now to break this down, 
I picked on the most common ones that we have actually looked at from our customers. And these are the ones that the most common instance families that we come across overall. So you have your general purpose instance families on the top left, the M3s, the M4, the M5, and the M5A, which is the AMD uh, equivalent of that. They're mostly general purpose. They're suitable for a wide range of applications. I've seen them being used from databases to web servers to uh, backend web servers as well. And in general, they have a four to one memory to vCPU ratio. Very, very common to use them. If you don't know which one to use, typically I see customers use the M series always. Now, what happens if you have a workload that's a little bit more comp computational intensive? Maybe you're running a high performance computing or you have a web server that has a huge computing demand on it, gaming or analytics. Then in this case, you wanna go towards something that has more compute power. And in this case, the C3s, the C4, the C5 and the C5As are more geared for this particular purpose here. They have a two to one memory to vCPU ratio and they deliver superior compute performance overall. Now on the other side of the spectrum, what if you have an application that's memory intensive? So for example, you're running high performance databases or you have in-memory cache or in-memory analytics or big data analytics. In this case, what we recommend is to go through an R3, R4, R5, or an R5A. Now these ones are really geared towards memory intensive applications. And as you can see, they have an eight to one memory to vCPU ratio. So very good. So you have one with the general purpose, you got one with the compute intensive, you got one with the memory intensive. Well, what if you want something in between? You want both compute and you want memory. Well, that's where you go to the Z1D. It provides a, it provides a good balance between the, the capabilities of R5 and the C5s. It has an eight to one memory to VCP ratio. And we see customers particularly use them for something like electrical, electronic design automation. Or if you have databases which have a high software license cost per core, then this is what they would recommend for you to use the Z1Ds. Now, the lastly, uh, if you have workloads that are burstable, they're in a steady state. And in this case here, maybe you're running some dev workloads, so you don't really need to get a C5 or an M5. Uh, your workloads are spiky in nature. In this case, a good selection, a good choice would be go to, to go with the T-series, the T2, the T3, or the T3As. They fall under the burstable family of EC2 instances. And what they offer is a baseline CPU performance. And as long as you're operating underneath that burst baseline CPU performance, let's say it's 20% for I think the T3 medium, then you continue to accumulate credits. And what these credits allow you to do is they allow you to burst up to 100% CPU for every single minute for one credit that you accumulate. So the idea here is that, you know what, you wanna operate below that particular threshold that the baseline performance, accumulate credits. And then when you wanna burst, you consume those credits, hit about peak capacity, and then you come down again. Now, there's also sustain and unlimited T3 options available there as well. For example, you could also purchase these credits in advance. That's the unlimited T3, and then you have to pay for them. And they're geared towards uh, virtual desktop environments, small databases, and most likely what we always see is dev environments always using these, okay? Now, as I mentioned, selecting an ECD instance has become increasingly complex because again, we talked about all the different factors that you have to consider. Add to this the pace of innovation that AWS is coming up with. AWS is constantly making new progress. This alone are about four different announcements that AWS made in the month of May that we have summarized for you here. They first announced the new M6G instances. They're powered by AWS Graviton. They're these ARM-based process, ARM processors that AWS has developed alongside with Annapurna Labs there. And they promise about 40% cost performance reduction over the X86 architectures in M5. Now, AWS tar targets these ones for ideally application servers, gaming servers, mid-size servers, uh, databases, or caching fleets, or web tier. The other thing that you also have to consider are price reductions. Uh, as the increasing com competition is going on between the different cloud providers, there's constant price reductions coming out. Again, in the month of May, AWS announced price reductions for reserved instances and savings plans, anywhere between one to 18% uh, for anywhere, any of the OSs that are running the free Linux OS there. So again, things to consider when you select your instances EC2, should I go ahead and buy a reserved instance or savings plan? What are my savings opportunities? How can I run it at the most cost optimized manner? Uh, when you're also selecting EC2 instances, you have to figure out what your AMI is. And sometimes those AMI names can be very, very hard to decipher. 
So AWS announced simpler AMI names. Essentially, these are aliases for your AMI, AMI names that you can refer to when you're spinning up your EC2 instances. And lastly, AWS announced increased storage and network bandwidth performance for the high memory instances. So now they can support up to 38 gigabytes of a dedicated storage bandwidth, or up to 100 gigabits of network bandwidth for select high memory, memory type instances as well. Okay, now Andy, off to you. Great, thanks Faisal. There is a lot of complexity being introduced on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, and that's why we built this uh, analytics engine to help deal with you know, how do you optimize this stuff? So many choices, new offerings on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, let me go through a, just a couple slides to set the stage on how we add value uh, to deal with this increasing level of complexity. So if you want to start building that out for me, Faisal, that'd be great. Um, we start with the, the engine basically takes in a number of inputs. The first is an agentless analysis of all the different workload patterns uh, that we would gather from uh, the instances. So we'll pull in CPU, disk and network IO, uh, IOPS, memory, uh, we pull in the different infrastructure characteristics depending on where that workload is running. Obviously today we're focused on AWS, but if you say moving, migrating from the cl uh, one cloud to another or from on-prem, we need to be able to normalize the relative behavior of the different processing capabilities from one platform to the other, the different thresholds that are supported. Uh, we'll pull in that information, benchmark it, we pull in the technical rules and effort because we also need to make sure that any recommendations we make are not going to bend the laws of nature and make a recommendation that can't be implemented or automated. Uh, we leverage the tags uh, and that will help us treat different workloads differently. We'll be able to report on different, um, uh, you know, how, how certain uh, groups are doing uh, from say a, a business unit, application, whatever it might be. And that allows us to create fit for purpose policy because obviously, you don't want to treat your test dev staging environments the same way as you would production critical. So the policy allows us to make recommendations that are suited for the type of application or business unit, what have you. The outputs from this engine uh, and the focus here today is obviously cloud resource optimization. So our analytics will analyze those workload patterns, build that predictive model for the future and say, this is uh, the right size based on the application demand we're seeing on those instances this is the correct instance that you should be running to, to better optimize, whether that be increased size to deal with risk or basically a smaller size or a different family to deal with efficiency. Uh, as well, we do analysis around VMware environments containerized, basically likening this to a game of Tetris packing workloads together. Migration and analytics as you're moving forward to move from one platform to the other. And finally, deciding on the best purchase vehicle, whether that's on-demand, reserved instances, savings plans. Those answers are consumed by people through reporting engines in our dashboards. The approval mechanisms can go through an ITSM ticketing process. So for closed loop, I make a recommendation, but that has to be approved by someone either through a ticketing system or potentially through a collaboration system like Slack or Microsoft Teams. And then finally, the entire ecosystem can be automated, fitting into your DevOps pipeline, CI, CD workflow to take those recommendations and ensure that those workloads are continuously and, and forever optimized by integrating into things like CloudFormation, as an example. Next slide, Faisal. In terms of what we do in the cloud optimization, it really fits into four categories, figuring out the right type and quantity of uh, services from AWS, in particular on the EC2 side, uh, auto scale groups and the RDS, ensuring that we're not being wasteful. So again, sizing that, uh, that demand correctly with the existing supply. The precision and the exact answers, so the ability to say this is exactly what's going to happen to your instance, Mr. Application Owner, so that uh, they are comfortable with the change, so that the details of what we produce through what we call the impact analysis, so the Application Owner Report, and they're comfortable with the changes that are being uh, proposed for their, uh, their instances, and finally, based on that information, uh, being able to actually automate it, again, through that CI CD pipeline. And the last slide I have before we move to demonstration is the types of recommendations we're doing. We're making sure that the engineering and application owners are comfortable. They care more about performance and stability. They don't really care that much about the cost for the most part, but IT finance does. And so these recommendations have to do the balance between ensuring performance and stability, but also recognizing that there's a constant pressure even in these days to reduce that cloud bill. So from an instance and database resource optimization, you'll see some of the recommendations. I won't go through them all today uh, because Faisal is going to show you a couple examples. But in particular, the upsize 
the modernize the recommendations that are most important are the cross-family ones. So maybe we've determined that a workload is running on a general purpose, and that would be better served by compute optimized based on the patterns that we are seeing. So for instance, database uh, recommendations, you'll see them uh, specific to those types of recommendations, scale group optimizations, sizing up and down the nodes to better suit the application pattern, of course, modernized cross-family, and then also recommendations all the way down to your Kubernetes, your container resource optimization, the ability to actually right-size, analyze what's happening there, and make recommendations to ensure that the containers are also sized correctly. In the interest of moving to demo, let's do that right now. So Faisal is going to take us through a, a couple of specific examples uh, of what this looks like inside the Densify interface. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Andy. So here I have our demo instance overall, and we're looking at a particular recommendation. As we said, selecting an EC2 instance can be very, very complex with all the different criteria that you're looking at. So in this case here, we have a developer who's gone ahead and spun up a demo instance. And in this case, they went ahead and spun up a C4, two extra large Linux EC2 instance. Now they thought their workload was actually compute optimized because that's what they thought they were running there. However, what we did is we did our analytics. And when we did the analytics, what Densify did is we took a look at the actual workload as Andy described, the CPU, the memory, the network IO and the disk IO, alongside with the policy, alongside with the benchmarks and the functional tags. And we assessed this against all 275 plus EC2 instance types to arrive at what's the ideal EC2 instance type that gives you the best performance at the lowest possible cost. And in this case, what Densify comes up with is a recommendation to say, hey, you should consider going to an R5A large. So go from a compute optimized to actually a memory optimized workload. Very interesting. Well, where did we come up with that recommendation? Well, here is the actual details. So we're not a black box. We're actually gonna show you how we arrived at that data. In this case, you're looking at about 60 days of data for this particular instance. And what we have done is we actually gathered the CPU metric, the CPU utilization over the last 60 days. And then we said, let's understand what exactly is this thing doing over a typical 24 hour cycle. In this case, as you can see here, what this thing does is it actually averages around seven or 8% CPU at its best. So for something that's compute optimized, it's not really using a whole lot of compute capacity. In this case, Densify is saying, hey, how about you consider moving over to an R5A large? Okay, if I were to move over to an R5A large, here's how that workload would now look like. In this case, as you can see, we've increased the CPU utilization by 22 percentage points here. We've gone up to 29%. So that's a better utilization of the CPU power. But not only CPU, we want to make sure that the other dimensions of metrics are also good and valid as well. So what we're also cross-examining is we're looking at the memory utilization. And in this case here, we looked at the memory utilization. The memory utilization is around 59%. So we keep it around the same. So we're not actually decreasing memory allocation or increasing, we're keeping it constant. And we're also validating against network IO and disk IO checks. Because overall, when you give a recommendation, you wanna make sure that it is sound and it's accurate. Another thing that we do that's different than anybody else is that we actually take into consideration what's known as effort. Effort is very, very unique to Densify. So for example, I know some workloads that need to be configured over takes a lot more time. Maybe it's a special AMI. Maybe I need to install the new ENA driver. Maybe I'm going from Intel to AMD or going to an ARM processor or a special type of application. I'm running an SAP HANA application, it takes a lot of time to set up. Well, what you can do is you can actually put effort points in here to say, these kind of recommendations are easier for me to implement. These kind of recommendations are more difficult for me to implement. You can also have recommendations that are actually aware of your RIs. So as you can see, this column here is actually aware of, hey, have I purchased an RI already? Okay, I've already purchased a standard RI. If I have, then I wanna wait until that standard RI is actually fully utilized before I actually make this change. So our recommendations are actually RI aware. In this case, I don't have any RI purchase. So it's a good recommendation. I can go ahead and make that. You also get to see your savings opportunity. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and make this change. How much is this gonna save me? So you get to see the actual pricing details, current price, recommended cost, and your savings opportunity. And lastly, what's the secret sauce of Densify, as Andy mentioned? What we do is we're the only ones that actually captures infrastructure benchmarks. 
So as you can see, in this column here, we have the benchmark of the compute optimized and the recommended instance. And now we use that to actually programmatically and scientifically calculate what exactly is your recommended CPU utilization going to be on the projected instance so that you can feel more confident taking the recommendations there. Uh, I'm looking at the time here, Andy. I would like to pass it back to you for the next steps there. Actually, just one more thing, uh, Faisal, could you go back to that? And uh, it just uh, one more interesting piece, and it's just in the idea of the impact analysis report. Would you mind clicking on that and maybe just explaining a little bit about uh, the details and being able to uh, prove, uh, as opposed to you sure. mentioned black box. Uh, I think Absolutely. we got a, just a minute to deal with this too. No worries. Absolutely. So when I deal with system administrators or platform engineers or capacity planners, the challenge that they have is, okay, well, now that's why has these recommendations, but how do I get this in front of the actual app owner or the line of business owner or the developer? Well, well, well what Densify has done here is we have actually built a report and this report is just loading up right now. There you go. It's a PDF report that you can actually download. So rather than you scraping all the metrics and sending it over to somebody, you can actually uh, download this report or make an API call, pull this report, and everything that I just described to you regarding the recommendations, all summarized in this particular report, showing you your impact analysis overall before and after your actual recommendations, the actual impact on the resources, the resource comparison, the actual details, the actual details that the app owners, the developers, the system admins actually care about, and the finally, finally, the financial impact of this. So there's a single source of truth that you can now share with the entire team. And everybody knows why that change needs to happen and how to go about and accomplish that change. Yeah, I love this. This is great. Thanks, uh, Faisal. I appreciate you uh, spending the extra time there because a lot of times we get asked, well, my bill reader produces recommendations as well. And it's like, well, typically they're based on maybe saving, you know, $30, $40 a month, but they don't get into the level of details that will make an application owner comfortable that the change isn't going to impact performance. Uh, they know exactly why the changes are being made. So uh, that was great. As we wrap up here, uh, just a couple of slides left. Uh, if you're interested in actually seeing the Densify um, analytics running against your environment, we offer uh, free 14-day trials. Simply go to our website, uh, go to densify.com slash try or product slash trial. There's a number of URLs that will resolve. Fill out the form, we will contact you, and you will get a custom URL uh, with your credentials, essentially you log in, you provide your uh, your AWS, your IAM, or your your public secret key information, all controlled by you, uh, and then we'll analyze that and produce uh, information and dashboards that show what your opportunity looks like. So a very easy to set up, typically about 15 minutes of work on your time, and we can see how it's working in your environment. Uh, so we certainly urge you to uh, to have a try of that as well. And then, you know what I'm going to do is just have a quick look at the Q&A. We'll come back to this uh, in just a moment here. Uh, just a couple of questions here, Faisal, I'll just uh, throw them at you right now. Uh, one question is around uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise sources of data. So this customer has Datadog. Uh, and I want to know whether or not we'd be able to leverage that data and, and you know, what data are we leveraging right now? So maybe you can just go through quickly on uh, uh, if we can use that enterprise data and how do we get our data uh, that we do show on the interface. Sure, absolutely. Yes, uh, Densify is fully integrated, so we can actually work with Datadog or New Relic or Splunk or any other third-party metric source that you have. Uh, what we do overall is that we can inject and we can bring that data in from, from your third-party sources, put that into the Densify engine, and we can analyze that as part of the right sizing recommendation. Uh, as about how we get the actual data coming in, you described it, it's a completely agentless. So we use CloudWatch data or from Azure or Google, we use the, their native uh, data collection stack driver or Azure Resource Manager, and we pull the metrics in from that way. Completely agentless, yes. Okay, great. And one other question that looks like a bit of a follow-up to uh, the question around the bill readers, one customer saying that they have trusted advisor and cost optimizer in their environments today, and it produces some recommendations. How are your recommendations different? Sure. So when uh, developers or app owners are looking at recommendations, they want to make sure that these are recommendations that they can trust and rely on. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, they, they put their necks out on the line for these applications. These applications need to be stable. They need to be performing. They need to have a dedicated uptime. And that's what their main concern is. Cost usually goes to the background here. 
Now, what makes them confident that the recommendations are a few things. First, they want to know how the recommendation was derived. Is it scientifically accurate? As I showed you, we are, we are not a black box. We're looking at the actual metrics, CPU, memory, network IO, disk IO. We're looking at the actual infrastructure characteristics, that's the benchmarks, and we're showing you how we derived at that math. So now they feel more confident. The second thing that they feel more better about is that you know, trusted advisor or cloud, cloud optimizer, they only look at 14 days of data. So 14 days of data is very, very narrow period of time for any developer to feel confident about taking a recommendations. What Densify can do is by default, we look at at least 60 days of data and we can go up to a year's worth of data. So what this allows us, you know, us to do is to actually understand those end of quarter patterns or cycles, business cycles, and build on that level of detail, not just 14 days of data, but 30, 60, 90 days or a year's worth of data. So now you have a longer range of data. You feel a lot more confident. And the third part that they like about Densify versus the others is that now you have the ability to influence the policy. So you could say, hey, by the way, I looked at this recommendation, but I only want to run them on the compute family type of instances. Or this is how aggressively I can downsize. That's the risk I'm willing to take. So with Densify, you can tune the policy and that allows you to control how often and how aggressively you want to rec uh, get the right sizing run in your organization. So those are three things that I look at as, as how we are different than uh, the others in this industry right now. That's great. Um, and, and I think the, the details as we drill into the, you know, say 14 or, or 60 or a full years of data is the fact we are building that 24 hour predicted model. It's not just based on an average or a peak. It's based on analyzing exactly what that behavior is for every single workload type within that 24 hour period. Um, one last question. We're almost at the top of the hour, so I got time for one more. Um, Faisal just says, it, it sounds like there could be a lot of work in configuring this engine. Uh, for me to have to learn. Um, and I think we have a pretty good answer for that one. Uh, no, there's not a whole lot of work to be done to actually get this engine to work. We are a completely SaaS platform. So we host the solution. All we literally need from you is about 15 minutes of your time just to invest in setting up that connection. And again, it's completely agentless. So we pull that data in. Once we have arrived at the data, we got the data, within 24 hours to 48 hours, we actually have our first review with you to show you what your opportunity is in terms of optimization. And so once we have identified that, we actually say, okay, well, let's understand your success criteria. Let's build a actual proof of uh, concept plan. And we walk you through your actual success criteria and we show you what the actual uh, results are at the end of it, help you build that ROI. So very, very minimal investment from you, except for that 15 minutes to actually get connected. And that's about it. And I think the other uh, component there is the fact that is, you know, customers or prospects as they uh, become customers, um, the nice thing is, is that uh, an expert like yourself ends up staying with the project and we help curate the results and some of our customers that don't want to learn our software don't have to because of the fact that we include a cloud expert with our license. Um, and so that gives a lot of folks, you know, some people that don't want to learn how to use the software, don't want to read an 800 page manual, don't have to. Some people do want to get their hands dirty and certainly they do that and, and are, are welcome to the training, et cetera. But the nice thing is, is the SaaS Plus model offers uh, both angles. So just looking at the time, we're at the top of the hour. Let's close off this uh, webinar today just talking about the next ones. So save your spot. We do have a couple ones coming up. Uh, next month in June, we are going to talk about right sizing and automation at scale in the cloud. Uh, so we'll talk about some of those CI CD tools and some of the, uh, the different uh, DevOps frameworks that we can integrate into and taking some of these recommendations and how we actually make that happen. And then in July, we'll talk a little bit more about AWS savings plans versus reserved instances. We see savings plans have been out there for a while. We still see customers that are investing in reserved instances. Which ones should you use? When should you use them? Uh, so we think that's, uh, that's going to be great uh, content for folks as well. So thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate uh, you spending it with us. You're uh, going to enjoy your lunch or your dinner as it were, and we will see you next time. Take care.